Chapter 8. Can Spoils the Party. As soon as Yuki heard, she ran home to tell Emmy. There's going to be a wedding at the church this afternoon, she shouted breathlessly. Emmy didn't have to be told anymore. When shall we go? she asked. The days were beginning to grow long and dull, and until the schools opened, Yuki and Emmy were constantly watching for any unusual event, outside of going to the recreation hall that would add some excitement to their day. Yuki and Emmy went to the church barrack early and stood outside waiting to catch a glimpse of the bride. Inside, they could hear a small reed organ pumping out the wedding march, and then they saw the bride. She was smiling and radiant, wearing a white satin gown and carrying a bouquet of white roses ordered from outside. Friends of the couple had gotten some rice to throw at them, and Yuki picked up whatever she could from the ground and tossed a few grains herself. Then the couple climbed into a car decorated with signs and tin cans and drove off amid shouts and laughter and a honking of horns. Where will they go? Emmy wondered. They can't leave camp, can they? Let's find out, Yuki suggested, and they took off, running as fast as they could to keep the car in sight. It headed toward the grandstand, and then it went around and around the track several times before it finally drove off toward one of the stables where the newlyweds would make their home. Yuki groaned. What a honeymoon that was, she said dismally. I'll say, Emmy agreed. Maybe they'll have a party later on, with wedding cake. And ice cream, Yuki added, with sandwiches and nuts. Uh-huh, and hamburgers, and steaks and fries with ketchup. Oh, they don't serve things like that at a wedding party, Emmy said at last. I know it, Yuki said, sighing. It just felt good to think about those things. It seemed they were always thinking about food. In fact, Yuki had just written to Mimi, asking her to please send something good to eat. I'm up to my ears and potatoes and bread and weenies and beans, she complained shamelessly. I'll give a million dollars for a milkshake and a hamburger. Mimi and her mother not only sent in packages of cookies and crackers and cheese, but as soon as visitors were permitted to come, they drove down with Miss Jameson, laden with good things to eat and flowers from their garden. When the messenger arrived with a notice telling them that they had visitors, Yuki ran all the way to the grandstand. Visitors were not permitted on to the campgrounds and had to be met during visiting hours in the grandstand hall. The large room was crowded with visitors from outside, but Yuki quickly spotted Mimi's red dress and her long blonde hair. Mrs. Nelson stood beside her, laden with packages, and next to her sat Mrs. Jameson, her flame-colored hair tinted beautifully, holding a large box carefully in her lap. Mimi, Yuki shouted joyfully. Mrs. Nelson, Mrs. Jameson. It was a great laughing, hugging, handshaking reunion. And everyone wanted to talk at once. We had to wait in line for two hours before they let us in, Mimi said ruefully. I know, Yuki nodded sympathetically. We stand in line for everything inside the fence, too. It's a lousy system. I baked a chocolate cake for you, Yuki, Mrs. Jameson said, thrusting the big package toward her. It's got chopped walnuts and marshmallows in the frosting. And here are more crackers and cheese and nuts and cookies, Mrs. Nelson added, setting off another round of hugs and squeals and much bowing by mother. If only Ken were here to help them carry everything back to their stable, Yuki thought, but Ken was busy working as an orderly at the hospital where he earned $8 a month. If he ever got promoted, he would earn $12 a month. Some salary, he laughed, but even the top professionals made only $16 a month, so Ken could scarcely complain. That was the established rate for all the evacuees, and no one could earn more. As Yuki looked around the big hall, she suddenly saw Ken at the other end of the room. He was with several of his college classmates, talking to some Caucasian men and women. They seemed to be listening intently to whatever it was the visitors were saying, and it must have been important enough for Ken to take time off from work. There's Ken, Yuki said. I'll go get him. But first she had to know about Old Saul and about Pepper. Mrs. Nelson had called Andy just before they came. Then Yuki and Mother described their stable, the smaller mess halls that had now opened up throughout the camp, the churches, the hospital, the library, and the recreation centers. And by the time Yuki turned to look for Ken, he and his visitors were gone. It was soon time for all visitors to leave, and the kisses and hugs were not as joyful. We'll be back soon, Mrs. Nelson promised, with more cakes and cookies, Mrs. Jameson added. She squeezed Yuki's hand and said, You know, not a day goes by that we don't think about you. Me too, Yuki said, and it was true. As full as her mind was of her new friends and her new life, she always thought of their old house and the neighbors and Pepper and Old Salt after she got in bed and closed her eyes. 
And whenever she dreamed, it was always of their old home back in Berkeley, never about camp. It seemed that half of her was still back at home, even though her physical self was sitting in a horse stall in Tanforan. See you soon, Yuki, Mimi called, and she turned to wave again and again until she disappeared for the, through the door. That evening, as they lined up outside the mess hall for supper, Yuki asked Ken, Who are you talking to during visiting hours? You miss Mimi and her mother and Mrs. Jameson. Ken seemed distracted and absently swung the container with their dishes inside. Be careful, Kenichi. The dishes will break, Mother warned. But Ken's mind was on other things. Huh? Yuki asked again. Who were those people? From the university, Ken replied at last. One was the dean of men, and one was the executive secretary from the Y. The dean of women came too. Oh, Yuki said. That didn't sound terribly interesting to her, but Mother was anxious to know more. What do they have to say, Kenichi? she asked. Was it about school? Oh, they said a lot of things, he said briefly. Ken seemed reluctant to say more, and soon they moved into the mess hall, and they talked, and the talk turned to other things. Emmy and her grandparents sat with them, as they usually did, and once again, Miss Kurihara was unhappy about something. I hear there's going to be an election, he said, contemplating his supper. It seems the camp is divided, is being divided into five precincts, and we are to elect representatives from each one to serve on a camp-wide council. That sounds fair and reasonable, Mother said. But Emmy's grandfather shrugged. They say we Issei are finally going to be able to vote. Well, what's the use of voting in Tanforan? It's only a temporary racetrack town, and we'll probably be out of here by fall. Yuki didn't like to hear such talk. She didn't want to think about being moved again, and what was wrong with being able to vote anyway. If her mouth hadn't been full, she might have said so to Mr. Kudiha. As it was, she could only give him what she considered a disapproving look. Well, it's the beginning anyway, said Ken's head. Maybe someday the Issei will be permitted to become citizens and be able to vote on the outside, too. Mr. Kurihara shrugged. When this war ends, I may just go back to Japan, he murmured. At least I won't be an enemy alien there. It was Emmy who, finally, who, spoke, who suddenly spoke up. Her face flushed, her voice rising. Well, I'm not going with you if you do, she said defiantly, and she picked up her dishes, marched to the dishwashing area, where she quickly washed her dishes in the tub of soapy water, and left the building. She hadn't even waited for dessert. Good for Emmy, Yuki said, but not in a very loud voice. She had never heard Emmy speak out like that to her grandfather, and she felt proud of her. Mr. Kurihara was too full of bitterness, and Emmy was right not to have any part of it. Yuki couldn't save any of the chocolate pudding for Emmy, but she took the cookie that came with it for her, and then she remembered the cake and cookies that her neighbors had brought. Hey, Ken, she said brightly, let's have a party tonight. Great, he said quickly. Maybe there'll be something to celebrate. Like what? You'll find out, Ken said, and he quickly got in line to wash his dishes, striding on ahead so he could round up Jim and his friends. Stop by and invite Mr. Toda, too, Mother called after him. Okay, Ken called back. And Reverend and Mrs. Wada, if you see them, Mother added. But by then, Ken was gone. Yuki was glad he hadn't heard. After all, there was only one cake, and it would stretch only so far. It wasn't until Jim and some other friends came back to the stall with Ken that Yuki learned what Ken had been excited about. The deans from the university had been here to urge the students to leave camp as quickly as permitted and finish their education. They told us about scholarships that would be available in the colleges in the Midwest and back east, where Japanese are permitted to be free, Jim explained. We're all thinking about applying and getting out. You too? Yuki asked Ken. Ken looked down at his shoes. Well, I was thinking about it, he admitted. You mean you'd leave Mama and me here and go out by yourself? Ken didn't want to answer. He was torn between wanting to go out and finish school and staying to look after Mother and Yuki until Father returned. But Mother eased his mind. Of course you must go out if you have the opportunity, she said quickly. Father would want you to do that, and so would I. But I wouldn't, Yuki blurted out. It would be terrible to have Ken leave. And besides, the last thing Father said was for Ken to look after her and Mother. There was a knock on the door, and Mr. Toto arrived with a small bag of peanuts for Yuki. Yuki thanked him politely, but not even that, or the thought of the delicious chocolate cake with nuts and marshmallows, could cheer Yuki now. 
There was no further talk about scholarships or finishing school, but Ken had already spoiled the evening for Yuki, and she felt as though a great black cloud had suddenly descended to engulf her in its gloom.